Good morning, good morning. Pleasure to be with you again, at least in this way. You may change your mind once we hit about 2.30 and I'm still going. The last uh, number of times I've had the opportunity to share with you have simply begun with a, with a video to give you kind of a context to where my, my head has been over the course of the previous week. Fortunately, this week there's really no way to give a specific video or a specific topic to kind of share with you where my head's been because my head's kind of been all over the place. But I will share with you a couple of things, uh, but in, in the, uh, just kind of where my, some of the things I've been studying, some of the things I've been looking at. Uh, first to give you context, but second because I also feel that they're directly relevant to the passage that we'll be walking through today. So, I was wa walking through and looking at a study. For those of you that don't know, I spent a lot of time working with college students, uh, specifically at USM and, and around Maine. And, um, if you think of it, we are having our fall conference next weekend, so if you think to pray for us, there'll be probably 60 to 70 of us joined together next week uh, down Old Orchard from a bunch of different schools around New England, and so we certainly would cover your prayer uh, around those things. But as, as I kind of dig through, I often study a lot about what goes on in, uh, in the hearts and minds of students and in the hearts and minds of... And so this week, there's two things I'd like to share with you specifically. Number one, uh, looking at a study on, um, forgive me, self-esteem, and looking at this generation in particular, as far as the quality of their self-esteem, as it relates to the quality of self-esteem that was 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 years ago. And what we're finding in students is that the self-esteem quality has gone from here to here. And so one of the, th the studies that I was looking at was trying to explain why. And I don't offer this as a, as a way to add veracity to the study, simply to give you information as to what's going on in my mind. And so, the study was fascinating in that my generation grew up with a very strict standard of what is right and wrong, and it was passed on to me through my family, and in many cases passed on through the, the faith traditions of the, of, the, of the family of origin, right? Does that make sense? And so as I grew older, there were a number of places where even in my 20s, well, I guess especially in my 20s, my mom would look at me and go, dude, what are you doing? You're a disaster. Great for self-esteem. No, it's... <laughs> but what happened was there was, a, there was a, an anchor for me to be able to kind of revert back to to say, this is where I'm going to place my values. This is what was taught to me. And so as I would go back and correct, those different things, that there would be a, hey, that's better. Okay, that's more like it. This is, now we're moving in the right direction. And as we finally began to settle into career and marriage and family and those things, all of a sudden, the affirmation that I so desperately needed, which came from my family, added to my self-esteem, which added to my ability to achieve, if that makes sense. The study went on to say that in the generation that we're working in now, there's a significant push to walk away from any type of thing that you're getting at home and move into your head and try to identify for yourself exactly who you are, exactly what you stand for, all of the rights and wrongs that go along with who you are, and then begin to live your life based on those things. Does that sound accurate to you? And that's what, that's what this study was. Again, I'm not trying to you know, get to the truth of the study. I'm just simply mentioning this is what the study said and get in what my mind has been. And what they said was, as these things begin to move into reality and move outside of the head and into our actual lives, this generation has been taught two things. Number one, affirm whatever it is that you hear from somebody else as their truth. And live your truth. And those two pieces are, are side by side. And what's happened is, as a result of that, everybody comes out of their own mind, identifying the way that they identify in whatever area of life it is, and demanding affirmation. 
from everyone around them, knowing full well that they're expected to give it in return. And as a result, the trust factor has gone out the window and nobody believes anybody's truly affirming them anymore, and as a result, self-esteem has gone right to the floor. Again, I don't know if that's right, wrong, or otherwise, it's a fascinating study, something that we think about a lot as we deal with uh, different folks as they're, as they're kind of going through life and walking through the different areas of their lives. So that's one. Two, it seems as though, and this was, this was from a conference call that I was on on Tuesday, um, and specifically, those of you who are familiar with the Navigators and the work that I do there, the, the city leader for the Navigators in New York City is a, a man named Peter Troutman, who is uh, stellar, both in the manner in which he does ministry and the manner in which he teaches. Um, and he was citing a different study, however, talking about the fact that as it relates to the manner in which we share the gospel, the manner in which we gain an ear, have a voice, is directly related to the generation that somebody comes out of. And so there are four kind of gateway questions that we have to address if we're going to walk into a specific area and have a specific conversation and receive trust. So for my dad's generation, the, the, the gatekeeper question was, what is true? Is this truth? For my generation, it is, is this real? What is real? For when you hit the, the postmodern, the Gen Y, what is good? And then in this generation, now what is beautiful? And if we can't hit the answers to those questions, we lose our voice with each generation. And as a result, you see, if you've ever been in a meeting with planning programming for our church or any church, you see different ideas for different generations and everybody going, that's never gonna work. For that, yeah, that's a great idea, because that's my generation, I get that, right? And so, here's the crazy thing. My head gets wrapped in all of these things and I forget what truly matters. We're gonna walk through a passage today you know, that Jan was nice enough to read. We're going to look at the reality that if we're talking about what is true, what is real, what is good, and what is beautiful, the answer to every single one of those questions is Jesus. And that's what this passage is going to do. So I'd like to walk through five things with you today. That was just the introduction. You ready? <laughs> I told you we're going to be here for a little while. I'd like to walk through five things with you today. As we go through this passage, I'd like to talk about the firstborn of creation. I'd like to talk about the firstborn from the dead. I'd like to talk about the dwelling place of God, the peacemaker. I'd like to talk about the one who reconciles all things. And then lastly, I'd like to talk about what we need most and how to get it. First of all, the firstborn of all creation. If you open your Bibles with me, We'll be in Colossians chapter 1 this morning, looking specifically at verses 15 through 23. And I'd ask that we start the scripture reading this morning in verse 11, which is the previous paragraph leading into this, because Colossians was a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Colossae, which he had never visited, as Travis mentioned last week. And this letter, as it arrived, would not have been divided into chapter and verse, but simply would have been written all, and read all together as a letter. And so I wanted to include a few things from before as we walk into this particular place. So number one today, the firstborn of creation, verse 15. He, being Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. First thing I want to notice there is this term firstborn. 
And I typically don't like to get into, in, into specific, well, this is why this doctrine is right and this is why this particular thing is probably not true. But in this particular instance, it's really important that we realize that the term firstborn here does not indicate that Jesus was the first thing created. The firstborn word here is very, very different than that. In fact, it's probably more closely related to birth order. Who would receive inheritance? So, Jonathan Edwards, when he would talk about creation, would talk about the Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, pre-creation, existing together in perfect harmony, in perfect community, equally glorifying one another and needing nothing. And that creation, Edwards would argue creation was actually necessary because of that beauty to expand the circle. And that will one day include us in glory. If you read through this, Jesus would have been part of that initial Trinity and would in fact be the voice of creation. Digging through, if you want to dig through uh, John 1 3, Hebrews 1 3, there are a number of different places throughout Scripture we see that the voice of God that instituted creation, the agent of creation that wasn't. God's voice was Jesus. This is the God we serve. I think we also want to think about creation in the terms of seven days to build the earth and the people who live here. But if you read this, verse 16, and I think we need to slow down when we go through Scripture. We love to read through scripture and go, man, this is really good. There's a bunch of stuff here. And let's try it. And this is one of the interesting pieces of this passage. I was saying to Josh a minute ago, I believe that if we were to really slow down and take this as we, we could do six or eight different sermons out of these, six, these eight verses. And it wouldn't take a lot to do it. In fact, the interesting piece is going to be, we're going to talk this much about this and this much about this over the course of eight verses uh, today. That'll be, that'll be interesting. It says, for by him all things were created. Immediately we think of Genesis 1, the poem that had seven days, this is what it was. But this says, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So this suggests more than just earth. This suggests more than just us. This suggests that the author of heaven was Christ. This suggests the author of the throne room of heaven was Christ. This suggests that all of the spiritual dominion that we can see throughout scripture was created by Christ. This is the, create, the creator, Christ the creator, I would even argue in the middle of this, you could make a, a good argument that it is creating in the present tense. We talk about rulers, we talk about in him all things hold together as a present tense word. This is not something that happened in seven days and stopped. This is something that's already going. Christ himself holds all of the planet together, holds all of eternity together. Hebrews 1.3 says he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Again, talking about Jesus. Why is Paul doing this? Why is he going into this type of detail on who Jesus is? I think there's two things. It's really important that there's an understanding as we walk through this passage and walk through the scriptures in general that Jesus was in fact God. 
100%. And what we'll hit next is equally important, that when Jesus finally came to earth, he was 100% man. If he is not 100% God, he does not have the authority or the power to forgive our sins. If he is not 100% man, he does not have the qualifications necessary to be the blood sacrifice required to pay the debt for me. Both are equally necessary. Let's continue on. This, this is going to go quick. Number two is the firstborn of the dead. Verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Firstborn here means exactly the same thing. It's the same word uh, in the original Greek that it was for the firstborn before. But there's a distinction here that he is the firstborn from the dead. Jesus was the first to rise from death and not die again. As such, it makes him the head of the church. All who believe in Christ, all who believe that Christ, the way, the truth, the life, <coughs> his resurrection guarantees ours. In fact, if you look in Revelation chapter 1, John writing about seeing Jesus in his heavenly form says, When I saw him, he fell at his feet as the dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and hell. Yes, I have the keys of death and hell. Are you worried about death and hell? Don't be. Jesus Christ holds the keys. Yes. He won them when he broke death. Yes, amen. You understand? Death worked a certain way for a really, really long time. 100% success rate barring maybe one or two, but the percentages still work. Jesus raises from the dead and he breaks death. It doesn't work right anymore. Yes, amen. This is the Jesus who did this for us to take this circle that was perfect, giving equal glory, expanding it, and now includes us. <clears throat> you fascinated yet by this Jesus? Completely God. Completely man, both being 100% necessary to the genius of the gospel, that now in a legal standing we have acceptance before God. We have access to the throne of grace through Christ. And then lastly, the centerpiece of what I believe this passage is in verse 18 that in everything he may be preeminent. Everybody know what the word preeminent means? I didn't. I had to look it up. It seems obvious from the context what it would mean. But the reality is, is it really just means first place. All of these things were put under Jesus so that he may be first place. Other translations will say supremacy that he would have supremacy. I would actually, I don't know if I'm supposed to do this, but I, I actually wonder if there shouldn't be a definite article there. Not just that he would be supremacy, but that he is the supremacy. That he is above all. Verse 19. The dwelling place of God. There's a weird thing that happens here. 
For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. What's reconciliation? Everybody know the meaning of the word reconciliation? I had to look it up. <laughs> you see, throughout Scripture, there's all these words that we know the meanings of, but we don't really know what they mean if we're asked to give a definition. And so as we talk through the idea, as you read through Scripture for yourself, slow down. Pick it apart. It's rich. It's loaded with things that we understand but don't quite get. The term reconciliation, as my daughter would love to tell you, in her favorite class, is an accounting term. <laughs> what you do when you reconcile the books is that you make sure this line adds up to this line and that they come up correct at the bottom end. I hate details. I hate reconciliation. Except when it pertains to me. You see, my balance sheet is out of the way. When we talk about the fact that all things have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that means me. I do not add up to God's glory. I know that's shocking for those of you who know me. <laughs> my children can be quiet right now. My life does not add up to the glory of God. I fall short simply by waking up in the morning. Mostly because it's morning. <laughs> and yet the reconciliation that happens to my account, the God math that does not work anywhere else, says that me and my mess Plus, Jesus and his work on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection, his life exchanged for mine, equals I am okay with God. We're going to read in a few verses that we are, in fact, once were alienated from God. And in there, we'll start getting into the gospel a little bit more. But my balance sheet doesn't work. Anybody ever thought poorly of somebody else? No? Not in this church, right? We're, we're going to that all figured out. Anybody ever been selfish? Sorry to say your balance sheet done that up either. And that's the easy stuff. Forget the habitual sin that I can't seem to get rid of. Stuff that I bring to God all the time and go, hey God, it's me again. Can you forgive me again for this? Can you forgive me again for this? Can you forgive me again for this? Can you help me get past this? Can you help me give this to you in a different way so that I don't have to keep coming back to you? The one who loves me and share the same thing over and over again, even though you died for me. You see, our motivation for following the rules and the laws of God is not based on God said it, therefore please do it, although there's peace of that. The reality is the result of my reconciliation to God through the work of his son is what allows me to be able to sit and say, yeah, I want to follow you. Yes. I wish I could be more like that. I wish I could be somebody who forgives the way you forgive. Yes. I wish somebody, I wish I could be somebody that sacrifices the way you sacrificed. And I believe you always show me the best possible way to live. And I want to know more about who you are. And I love the end of that verse. Making peace by the blood of his cross. 
Isn't it amazing what Jesus has done? Giving up everything in which he is preeminent. To say, hey, by the way, you know me, I'm that God guy that created everything. I'm the one who put the stars in existence by my hands. I'm also going to stretch those hands out on as to them living for you. That's pretty cool to me. All of the glory goes to the grace giver. All the glory goes to the grace giver, not to me. And yet within the framework of my selfishness, of my Phariseeism, of all the places where I take and pat myself on the back for anything that belongs to Christ that I put on myself for some reason, I want to give glory to me. In fact, the majority of the issues that I have in my life, the places where I have to work through sin, the places where I go to God and say, you know what, I've blown it again, can you please forgive me again, are all places of me worship. That replaced him worship. Verse 21. Number four, the one who reconciles all things, and then what we most need. Number five. Verse 21. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in the body of his flesh, on the bo- sorry, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting, from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. If we read this through quickly, it says, if we continue, and we immediately in our heads process it, if you're anything like me, God did this for me, I must act this way. It's not what it says. It says, if we continue in the faith, what does that mean? This is what I believe we need most. All of these places that we've talked about, the the greatness of God, the glory of God, who Jesus is, who he is to me, who he is to you, who he is to creation, who he is to all who believe. All of the preeminence, all of the supremacy, all of the first place ness that he deserves. This is what we need most. I'd like to read a passage to you from the beginning and preface of a book that Jerry Bridges wrote called Respectable Sins. Don't worry, I'm not going to judge you. In the preface, he said, while seeking to address these respectable sins, however, I also want this to be a book of hope. We are never to wallow hopelessly in our sins. Rather, we are to believe the gospel through which God has dealt with both the guilt of our sin and its dominion over us. The gospel, though, is only for sinners. for those who recognize their need of it. Many Christians think of the gospel as only for unbelievers. Once we trust in Christ, so the thinking goes, we no longer need the gospel. But as I seek to bring out in this book, the gospel is a vital gift from God, not only for our salvation, but also to enable us to deal with the ongoing activity of sin in our lives. So we still need the gospel every day. I believe that's our greatest need. Is the need of the gospel. The beautiful story of God intersecting in our lives. Offering us hope. I'd like to close today by doing something somewhat unusual, which you know I me, mean, I guess it's not that unusual. I'd like to
to offer just a moment of quiet for us to reflect on the fact that we are sinners. Even post-salvation, we're still sinners. And then I'd like to take a moment and show you what Bridges means when he says, preach the gospel to yourself every day. And I'm simply going to do that by reading a handful of verses through scripture, which is how we'll close this morning. So take just a minute, if you would, go before the Lord. It may even be a great time for confession, something else we don't love about church. Romans 8, 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ from the law of sin and death. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Psalm 103, 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Psalm 130, 3 and 4. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. Isaiah 118, come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. 1 John 4.10, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. Philippians 3, 9. And be found in him, in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him. Romans 5, 8. For God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Timothy 1, 15. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Titus 3, 3 through 5. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of the works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.